Hello and welcome to the BX channel. I'm Kenneth Dentley, your host for the BX channel. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that you're going to be blessed by what I believe is going to change your life forever. You say you say that all the time. and You're absolutely right. I do say that a lot because I believe it. I believe the transforming power of the word of God. And I believe that you are going to be transformed as you listen to this word today. And you're going to be just graced by the Holy Spirit and through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so before we get into it, just like, subscribe. I tell you what, let's wait until the end of the video. And then you can say whatever you like. But I'd like for you to subscribe to our channel and then share it with others so that they can be a recipient of some of the grace that you've received in this message today. And so today we're going to be talking about the strength of God yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Now, I know that's a long title. I had to look down to even remember what it was. But as I was developing this message, um, I believe I heard the Holy Spirit say to tell the people just like that. And so that's what I want to do. I want to talk about the strength of God yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit in you. So before we get into the word today, let's pray and we'll get right into the scriptures. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you this evening as we come together to record this message so that the people in the YouTube audience will be able to hear the things that I believe that you're sharing with me to share with your people. You know, I can't do this in my own strength, never could, never will be able to. But I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of me. And I thank you so much, Father, for everything working properly as it should. We thank you so much for your helping us by your Holy Spirit. You're bringing back the remembrance of things that you share with me to share with your people. And we just give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And God, we thank you. All right, let's get into the Word of God. Now, first of all, we want to establish something in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse number 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Let's read it again. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then Paul in the book of Philippians says something to the church at Philippi in chapter 4 in verse number 13. But I'm not going to start at verse number 13 because... We're so accustomed to hearing this particular part of the scripture without hearing the rest of the story. Well, I'll start with verse number 11, where Paul says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned to both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, it's very important that I share that particular scripture with you the way I did, because a lot of people all the time, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and they leave it just there without reading the rest of the story in context. And here's what Paul said. He says, I've learned, I've taught myself, I'm trained on how to suffer need or how to be full you know, and this is something that I must emphasize because we're coming into a day and time whereby our faith is going to be tested. Our I can do all things through Christ is going to be tested. I'm telling you, please hear me. Listen to what I have to tell you. It is going to be tested. You're going to be put in places and time that you're going to suffer need. So you're going to have to learn how to function in Christ. As you suffer need. In other words, as you get to a place whereby you, your needs are not being met, you say, well, my needs will always be met. Well, that's going to be tested, my, my friend. And the reason why is because as we begin to see things transpire in our world today, how many of you know that our world has changed drastically since the last, the last month or so? Since we've come into the new year, our world has changed drastically. It seemed like when we came into January, February, Everything seems to be a little slow, but then March came in and boy, things begin to rev up. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to have to learn how to, 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 to be content in whatever state that you're in. You're going to have to learn how to be content with just some uh, uh, macaroni and cheese. <laughs> it's, you're going to have to learn how to be content with just, you know, a spam or learning how to be content with just peanut butter and jelly. You know, you might not have the bread because the bread's going to go up. You can find that in the book of Revelation. And I, I'm getting too far ahead of myself, but 
I want to just share with you, Paul says, I can do all things. In other words, I can suffer need. I can be full. I know how to function in whatever state that I'm in. And so therefore, we're going to have to learn how to do this because this is the secret to God's strength. When we're experiencing human weaknesses, then we know how to how to flow. We know how to how to navigate through the times in which we're in. We know how to to check ourselves and not to fly off the handle. Or even if we don't have, we're not tempted to steal from someone else or something like that. These are the times in which we're 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 going going towards. And so therefore, I want you to see that in the scripture. Now, the strength of God is seen in his creation. You know, remember, the Bible talks about in the book of Genesis. I don't want to really turn there, but I, I guess I'll just go there. And so that you can see what the Bible says here um, in Genesis. Um, OK, Genesis chapter one, verse number one says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was in the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, so here's what the Bible says. He said that the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. And so basically it was hovering over the darkness. And the Bible lets us know God said, and when God said the Holy Spirit, which I call the muscle of God, brought these things into existence. And so therefore, God said it, the Holy Ghost brought it to pass. Praise the Lord. And so the Holy Spirit being the strength or the muscle of God, he's the one that gets the things done. Amen. And you see that when we get over into the New Testament, how the Holy Spirit was the, the muscle of God when it came to the ministry of Jesus. And not only to the ministry of Jesus, but also to the ministry of the disciples, which we find in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, New Testament scripture, um, verse number says, verse number six, for it is God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then he went on to say in verse number seven, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Notice what he said. We have this treasure. What treasure? The treasure of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the excellency and the majesty and the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's dwelling on the inside of us. Amen. Why? 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 Because God don't want any flesh glorying in his presence. And we can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 29. We won't turn there, but nevertheless, the Bible says that no flesh should glory in his presence. And that's the thing about mankind. We boast in our strengths many times. We boast in our achievements. We boast in our abilities. Uh, you know, we, we boast about our decisions, our wisdom. Amen. You know, uh, my team's better than your team. You know what I'm saying? I got a winning team. You got a losing team. And what we're saying basically is that I have better, I have a better, uh, uh, how is it? Uh, I have a better um, choice. My ch ability to choose is better than yours because I chose a winning team and you got a losing team. And so therefore we're always pitting against one another. We're always competing with one another and nobody really wants to take the side of the hum humble side or, or the side of humility. But one of the things that we got to understand is humility is one of the fruit of the spirit. It's called meekness. And this is what Jesus said. He said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. Notice what Jesus said. And he said, then you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So therefore, if you're going to come to Jesus, you're going to have to develop humility. I'm telling you right now, the strength of God is found in human weaknesses. When you are weak, God is strong. Praise the Lord. Now, let's go on with this. God knows the fragility of man, the weakness of man, and God knows he need to help us. <laughs> you know, one of the things I used to say one time before was to my children when I was when I was about to get on them about something, I said, let me help you. And I didn't say it in a way of, like, let, me, let me help you with this. No, it was, my, let me help you. And so there comes a time where God has to help us as humans because this is what we need. We need help. We need the help of God. But the, the, the problem with humanity is that we're so arrogant. We are so conceited. We, we are so full of pride that we believe that we can handle everything by ourselves. You follow what I'm saying? When it comes down to a relationship between a man and a woman or a man and his wife, you know, the man wants to flex his muscles. You know, I'm the big boss. I'm the big guy. I'm the big kahuna. You know what I'm saying? And that he thinks because she's a woman that she's weaker. But let me tell you something, fellas, you know, that's far from the truth. There are times when we need to listen to our wives because God gave us a helper. Just like 
He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gave us a wife. And if you have a good spirit filled, born again, you know, tongue talking, Bible believing, a wife of prayer, a woman of prayer, rather, um, you know that she's strong. Praise God. We just read the scripture that says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Her strength comes from her relationship with the Lord. And that's the thing that I get, I'm trying to get people to understand right now is that the stronger we are, the more that we have a good relationship with the Lord. But if you don't have a strong relationship with the Lord, you're not going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. I hope I said that right because it seemed like I was confused a little bit there, but I don't think I, I don't think I was confused. I think I said it right. Amen. And this is why he gave us a helper. The first helper the Bible talks about, it's not good for man to be alone. Amen. And therefore, I will make a helper suitable for him. So therefore, listen to this. Listen to me. Hear me very carefully. So God at the beginning gave man a helper. He just didn't create man and just left him all alone without a helper. You follow what I'm saying? Animals, Adam named all the animals, you know, it was a, a he cow, a she cow, a he horse, a she horse, you know, a he goat, a she goat. All of them, they were paired. Everything was paired. Male and female created he them. Amen. But there was not a, a, a suitable companion for Adam. And so God said, it's not good for him to be alone. So what did he do? He put him to sleep. Amen. And then he went in and he did some surgery. I don't know how God did it. Don't matter. Don't matter. It was done. Amen. And the next thing you know, Adam wakes up out of his deep sleep and he looks up and he looks at this woman, this beautiful object um, that looks like him, that, you know, that, that, but, but it's different. It, it looks like him, but it's different than him. You know, he's got short hair, maybe she's got long hair, you know, he, she got curves. He's, you know, he's, he's buff, you know? And so, you know, it was just a, a, a beautiful thing, I believe. And, and, you know, I heard a preacher say one time before when Adam saw Eve, he said, whoa, man. And that's where we got whoa, man from. That's not true, but I, I just thought it would be something good to say. Hey, man, to give you a little humor in the message. But understand, when God created Adam, he gave him a helper. So therefore, when we come into the new creation of a race of being, when we come into Christ, guess what? He gives us a what? There you go. Come to the head of the class. He gives us a helper, and the helper is called the Holy Spirit. Now, let's find that in the scripture, because I don't want you to be left hanging on that. God knows we need help, right? And this is why he gives us a helper. He sent us the helper, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus said to his disciples in first and for John chapter 14, verse number 15 and 16. And I'm going to read this from the amplified translation of the Bible. So therefore, give me a minute and let me make sure I get to the right one. OK, here we go. Now, I'm going to read it to you in the amplified Bible. And this is the classic amplified version. You can just read it. It's going to be on the screen. Here's what the Bible says. If you really love me, you will keep, obey my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby, that he may remain with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, welcome, take to his heart, because it does not see him or know and recognize him. But you know and recognize him, for he lives with you constantly and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, desolate, bereaved, forlorn, helpless. I will come back to you just a little while now, and the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that time when that day comes, you will know for yourselves that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. The person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and I will show, meaning reveal, manifest myself to him. And I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. Judas, not Iscariot, asked him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself, make yourself real to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if a person really loves me, he will keep my word, obey my teaching, and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home abode, special dwelling place with him. We'll remind you of bring to your remembrance everything I have told you. Peace. I leave with you my own peace. I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed and do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. Now, once again, I read all of that because we're going to we're going to we're going to take some get some takeaways out of this right here. But Jesus made it known to us that he's not going to leave us alone. He's not going to leave us lonely or he's not going to leave us without a helper, without a confidant. Remember, God said it's not good for man to be alone. It is not good for the born again man to be alone. Therefore, I will give him a confidant. Notice what he says. I will give you a confidant, a counselor, a helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener and a standby. All of these things, and anyone on the say in verse number 26, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name to represent me and act on my behalf. Amen. Praise the Lord. And that's what God could have sent angels. Yes, yeah, good. We got angels. You know, he's given his angels charge concerning us. You know, he could have sent something else. But guess what? He sent himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. And so here we see the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, counselor, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby in our helper. That's who he is. And he says that he will dwell with us and will be in us. Glory be to God. God in us. Amen. God in us. That's what makes us different from the world because we have God in this, in, on the inside of us. He dwells in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's, let's grab that while we're talking about it. Okay. In the book of, um, First Corinthians chapter three, I'm sorry, verse number 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So that what makes us different from the world. We are holy because God dwells on the inside of us. We are the temple of the living God. And the Bible says that the spirit of God dwells on the inside of us. When I was young, I used to hear the older folks say that God don't dwell in an unclean temple. And that is true. He does not dwell in an unclean temple. So therefore, he cleans us up first. That's what happens when you get born again. He comes and he cleans you up. And then as you go through that transformation process, we call it sanctification. That means that you're setting yourself apart from the world and you're setting yourself apart to God. You're falling in love with him. You're, you're learning him. You're learning his ways. You're learning his, 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 what he likes, what he doesn't like. You're learning the difference between the clean and the unclean, the pure and the unclean, pure, the holy and the unholy. You understand what I'm saying? And so in that walk, the Holy Spirit is cleaning you up. And one of the things that, you know, the Bible tells us that, that Jesus said he will send the Holy Spirit to live in us. So what happened is that uh, God sent Jesus Christ to the earth to, to preach to mankind so that mankind can believe on him. And that's the way that we are saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after that, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to live in us, to prepare a place in us for God to dwell. Amen. You follow what I'm saying? So that's a good thing. Now, so he lives in us. He dwells in us. First Corinthians chapter chapter six this time. Okay, let's no notice what the scripture says here in verse number 19. Look at the bottom here of, of this page here in the scripture. It says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Amen. So therefore we are bought with a price. So we ought to glorify God in this body. We need to take care of this temple. We need to take care of this body. You follow what I'm saying? We need to take very good care of it. We can't just put anything in it. Are you with me? We shouldn't do everything. You know, I see some people, and I know I'm going to get some flack of this. I know before some of you got born again, you know, you um, you you kind of painted the temple. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. You kind of painted the temple and do all these kind of things. You know, some people I've seen, I mean, their whole upper body and arms and everything. I've even seen the legs covered up, you know, and things like that. You know, so this is the temple of God. And the thing we ought to do, we ought to make sure that the temple of God inside and outside looks like representation of God. Amen. That's all I'm going to say about that. OK. All right. So let's go into it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14, the Bible says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? 
for you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. Now he's quoting God. I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty. In the next um, in the next chapter, it says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Why? Because God is walking in us. He's dwelling in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, the temple of God is holy. We ought to be a holy people. That's why we ought to perfect holiness. How do you perfect something? You practice it over and over and over and over and over and over again. We said it before when we were children. Practice makes perfect. Well, pra practice really makes improvement, but it perfects your craft or your gift or whatever the skill that you have that you're practicing on. And so the thing that God wants us to do, he wants us to practice. The Bible says that exercise thyself unto godliness. So that's the basic, he's saying the same thing. He says, perfecting holiness, practice holiness. Amen. Holy living, godly living. Praise the Lord. God says, be ye holy for I am holy. So that means in every manner of conversation or conduct, we ought to be holy people unto God. That means that when we are holy, we are set apart unto God. Praise God, because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came from heaven to earth to dwell in the believers at Jerusalem. You know, he came to empower them to do the works of Christ in the earth, just as Jesus was sent to do the work of God in the earth. He said, my father work and I work. Amen. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Notice Jesus was sent. He said, the works that I do, I do because my father sent me. Amen. And so that's what the Holy Spirit's been sent to live in us so that we can continue to do the work that Jesus did in the earth. And this is how we're going to win the loss. Amen. By doing the works of the Lord. Now, Let's show you something in the book of Luke. I'm going to show you a promise that Jesus said, okay? All right. In the book of Luke, chapter 24, let's look at verse number 49. In the middle of the screen here, it says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. That word endued is the word clothe. It means to put your clothes on. Like, you know, Jesus said, I'm going to clothe you with the Holy Spirit. Now, understand that there are two experiences with the Holy Spirit. There is the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and there is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you receive the Holy Spirit, that's the agent that got you born again. See, if you don't have the Spirit of God in you, guess what? You're not His. That's what the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8. If any man have not the Spirit of God or Christ, he is none of His. So therefore, he is the agent that caused you to be born again, palingenesia. That word means to be again born, okay? So therefore, you are born again. The Bible says you're not born again by corruptible things, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So therefore, understand, folks, that we were born again. The Holy Spirit is the one that <laughs> breathed on us. Remember, he hovered upon the waters. And when God says, light be, guess what? He came. He brought it all to pass. And so what happens is, is that as born again believers, when you say, Jesus, I'll make you my Lord. I believe that you've been raised from the dead. I, I repent of my sins. Guess what? The Holy Spirit is the agent that comes and do the very same thing. That's why he call it the new creation. So it's just like the earth was created in six days. Understand man was created on the sixth day. You know, the same thing. Same thing. Man was in the sixth day, but it was a seven day creation. But God rested on the seventh day. You follow what I'm saying? And so therefore, Jesus said, I will give you rest. So when you receive Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is bringing you into the rest. You don't have to work or labor and strive no more and try to keep the laws and all of the, the, the commandments, the 613 um, statutes and ordinances that the Jewish people have to observe. You don't have to do it in your strength and in your might now. But he gives you his spirit and his spirit causes you to walk with him in righteousness and holiness that cause you to fulfill the law and to love your brother. Understand that that's, that's why we have to have the Holy Spirit because he's the only one that can cause us to walk in the commandments of God. Amen. Because let me show you another scripture. I, I'll show it to you. In the book of, uh, I, I'm ahead of myself, but I'm going to have to show you this one right here. 
in Romans 5, 5, notice what the Bible says, middle part of the screen here. He says, verse 5, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So therefore, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of love, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The Holy Spirit is the one that distributes, dispenses that love. So he's living on the inside of us, causing us to walk in love. And remember, Jesus said, or Paul said, that love is the fulfillment of the law. If you love your neighbor as you love yourself, guess what? You fulfill the law. If you love God above everything else, you fulfill the law. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Okay. So I, I got to get you to understand. So therefore, that's what happens. He says, stay in the city of Jerusalem until you be endured with power from on high. Now, Jesus's last words before leaving earth was recorded in the book of Acts, chapter one, verse number eight. Now, this is, this is the same thing that we just read about in the book of Luke, okay? Here's what Jesus said, all right? He's picking up the story. Same author. Luke is the one who wrote the book of Luke. Luke is the one who wrote the book of Acts, okay? So he's just continuing the story. Notice what he says in verse number eight. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, listen to this. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Jesus said, you shall receive power. Let me change the word power for a minute. I know it's the word, Greek word, ex exousia, but I want to use the word, but you shall receive strength, okay? Supernatural strength, supernatural empowerment, okay? So he says that's going to happen when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, all right? So now notice this. That's his last words to his disciples before leaving. He said, you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the other post parts of the earth. Now, let's look at the fulfillment of that promise. Go to Acts chapter two, verse number one says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from where? From heaven. That's right. As a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all, all, I'm saying it again, all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, let me say this to you. If you were in that upper room that day, you got filled with the Holy Spirit, because when the Bible says all, then the Holy Spirit is not playing with words here. He said they all were filled. If they had little children in there, guess what? Little children, you get filled with the Holy Spirit as well. Amen. If you're in there and you're seeking God, God said, you seek me, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. And those people were in there. They were digging in. They were in there waiting for the promise of the Father. And they were in prayer. Amen. And when they were in one accord, guess what? The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost as promised. So therefore, understand, they're now, okay, the same thing he said, you receive power to become witnesses. So the next thing we're going to see in this is them witnessing. Now, Here's the fulfillment of the promise. We just talked about that. Now, let's look at Acts chapter 3. We're not going to go through any more of that. Acts chapter 3, verse number 1 through 8. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the house of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on them with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Christ, of Jesus, I'm sorry, Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took them by the right hand and lifted them up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received what? Strength. That's right. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Amen. And when the people saw him walking and praising God, they knew that it was he who begged arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. And so I want to take you down to verse number 12. So the Bible says, oh, verse number 11, rather. the Bible says, now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them on the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, this is what I want to take you to, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk? Notice, 
Peter is saying, it is not by our own power. It is not by our own godliness. But in the name of Jesus Christ, through faith in his name, he was, this man was made able to walk again. You follow what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? This is not the strength of man. It's not the character of yet the charisma of man. This is not because of some eloquent speaking man. None of this, not because this man has an honorary doctorate. Guess this was a fisherman. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Some of you probably would have said Jesus is motley crew. Peter said, why look on us? It's not us, guys. It's not us. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Not about us. It's not. God will use you. But guess what? He will use you for his glory and not for yours. Amen. And for the, the salvation of lost souls. Now, let's look at Acts chapter four. We'll see the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit in the early church in Acts chapter four, verse number 29. And we're getting ready to close this out. All right. Now, here it is. Acts chapter four, verse number 29. OK, now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your service that with all boldness, they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal. And that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Here it is. Powerful boldness in the early church. Glory to God. Understand. He said they're threats. People will threaten you. That's what the chief priests and the elders and the scribes and the Sanhedrin did. That's what they did. They threatened them and told them, don't preach. Don't bring that name on us anymore in this place. But guess what? They persevered. Amen. So we see the power to witness on Christ's behalf when Peter preached to the, to the crowd on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people got saved. We saw that. And we see now the strength to preach boldly in the name of Jesus and what we just read in Acts chapter 4. And then we see the strength and the power to endure persecution in Acts chapter 5. Look at verse number 12. The Bible talks about this. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women, so that they brought the sick out in the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles to put them in the common prison. But at night, the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison, prison to have them bought. So long story short, when they went to the prison to have them brought out so they can try them, guess what happens? They, was, they, they weren't there. They were not there. <laughs> the angel of the Lord was sent to grab those guys out of prison so they could go and do the commandment of Jesus Christ. And that is to go into the world and preach the gospel. And so guess what? Those men were beaten. They were flogged. And they were threatened and said, listen, don't preach or teach no more in this name and bring this man blood upon our, our, our hands. But guess what? The Bible says in verse number 41. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus is as the Christ. So therefore, we can see that there's power or strength for persecution. And I believe that these days that we're about to approach um, very soon, that we are going to be entering into a time of serious persecution on the church and on believers. And so what I want you to understand is that God gives us power. Listen, you don't have to be weak. You remember, you remember what Jesus said? You know, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. Jesus never abandoned his people in the midst of persecution. He's right there. In fact, he gives us grace to endure persecution. And so we got to believe God. Somebody asked the question, how did those people in, in the, the martyrs back in the day, how did they, how were they able to endure, you know, knowing that they're going to be executed and things like that? Well, it's the grace of God. God will give us his grace. His grace will come upon us to help us 
to overcome the challenges of the, of the darkness. Listen, in the book of Revelation chapter 12, I'm not going to turn there, but the scripture talks about, and they overcome came him by the blood of the lamb, talking about the enemy, and by the word of their testimony. And that's not the only thing, because it went on to say, and they love not their lives even to death. So the Bible is telling us when we get to a place whereby we love Jesus more, we love our own lives. That's why Jesus told us in the scriptures, yo, he told us that um, he said, any man that loves a father, brother, wife, mother, all of these things, even children are more than to love me, is not worthy of me. You understand what I'm saying? So this is one of the reasons why you got to love Jesus more than you love anybody else, because the day is going to come when you have to make a decision. It's either listen to Jesus or listen to people, because people will tell you 110 reasons why you shouldn't allow yourself to be persecuted. Oh, child, you shouldn't let nobody treat you like that, even though you're a Christian. You know, we ain't weak. We, ain't, you know, all the things that people say, you know, come on, saints. Amen. Let me let me get off of that. Let me get off of that. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. We're, we're about to close this up. Hebrews chapter 11, we call this the Hall of Faith. And the Bible, the author in the book of Hebrews, is a very interesting read. You need to go into your, into your, um, go online and find out who could possibly have been the author of the book of Hebrews. Very interesting things you'll find there. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 34 says this. What more shall I say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jepheth, also of David and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still, others had trials of mockings and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were saw, stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect or perfected apart from us. Look at this, folks. Power. Not only to wax strong in weakness and not only to turn to flight the armies of the aliens, but we see the power of God coming upon people to endure the persecution. I mean, come on, saints. Son and two. Come on, saints. People were fed to lions. They were burned at stake. Some of the things that the early church Christians went through to endure for their love and belief in Christ Jesus is atrocities to us today. We'll be out picketing. We'll, we'll have our sign. We'll be protesting the atrocities that are going on with saints. You couldn't do that in the Roman Empire. Guess what? They would be out there too, fed to the lions. And so folks... We are entering into a time whereby the church must make up their mind will we serve God or will we serve man or serve ourselves. Amen. So the Spirit of God comes to us and helps us in our weakness, according to Romans chapter 8, verse number 26. Notice what he says here. Romans chapter 8. The Bible says here, verse 26. Hallelujah. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. Now, remember, we were talking about earlier that the Holy Spirit is called the helper. That's one of the sevenfold ministries of the Holy Spirit. He's there to help us. So he helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, so notice what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us according to the will of God. Now, that's like God praying for us, in us, praying for us. So therefore, God is strong. Who's stronger than God? So the Holy Spirit in us is praying his will for us in any situation. Guess what? Nobody's stronger than God. 
So therefore, in verse number 28, which we always uh, we always quote, but we don't understand. Notice what it says. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Notice what he says. These things are working together. When you're praying in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is praying for us, praying the will of God for us, all those things are working together for us. Don't take that scripture out of there. Don't extract it out of there and just leave it by itself. That scripture is pinned to scripture that says that he who searches the heart know what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. Now, let's notice something here. Jesus said in Zechariah chapter 4, I'm sorry, Jesus didn't say that. Strike that. Um, Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 6 says, It's not by my power or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So that's what happens here. It's by the spirit of the Lord. God is making all these things happen according to his spirit. And that's what strengthens us, folks. You remember in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse number 12, where it says, you know, the armies that were against um, Israel had come out against Judah. It wasn't Israel. It was Judah. The scripture talks about how King Jehoshaphat prayed in verse 3. It said he set himself, he feared, he set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered themselves together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek help. And the, the Bible talks about the prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed. You can read that in the scripture. And uh, then you, now here's where I want to bring you to. The Bible says in verse number 12, he says, Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do need, we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. Notice he says, we have no power. We have no strength against this great multitude. We don't even know what to do. I mean, have you ever been to a place whereby you had something that came up against you and you didn't know what to do? You were at your wit's end. You didn't know what to do. And the only thing you can do is pray. That's a good thing to do. Pray. That's what Jehoshaphat did. He prayed and fasted. Had everyone, little children, big children, huh? you know, teenagers, huh? everybody was out there praying. They were looking to God. Amen. Because <laughs> they know if this army had come out, the children of Moab, Mount Seir, and another one, and the children of Ammon, three armies that had come out against them. And the Bible says, they say, listen, this is a great multitude. We have no power or might against them. We don't even know what to do. But our eyes are on you, Lord. In other words, we're looking to you, the hills from which comes our help. And our help comes from the Lord. Now notice in verse number 18, the um, verse, uh, ver let's just go on. Let's just keep going with it. Verse 14 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mathaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asap in the middle of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all of you, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, you and King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord. Now God is doing the talking. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the, uh, the ascent, ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear nor be dismayed. Go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And so they did what God told them to do, and guess what? They got the victory. They got won the battle. It was three days getting the spoil. It was such a great thing. Amen. So here it is. When we yield to the Holy Spirit, the strength of God is revealed to us. When we don't know what to pray or how to offer it in humility, when we offer it to God in humility, guess what? God responds. He responds. And that's what he did in the story of King Jehoshaphat. There's so many things else I can tell you about that. But listen, let's, let's close this out. We've spent enough time. And I think you get the message of what I'm trying to tell you. All things work together for good when we pray in the spirit. These texts go together. They are not independent of one another. When we're praying in the spirit, we know that the Holy Spirit is praying with us the perfect will of God in any given situation. So if there's ever a time whereby you're weak, you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, you don't even have enough information to process and to pray correctly, guess what? Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. You're making yourself weak 
and he's beginning stronger. Let me show you that in the scripture. We'll close with that. Jude chapter. No, we're not going to close with that. We got one more after that. Jude chapter one, verse number 20 says this. Listen to what the scripture gives us. Uh, give us a, um, something to do. Notice what he says here. This one scripture right here. In verse number 20, it says here. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ until eternal life. Notice what he says, building up yourselves. That means building up like you're building an edifice. You are building up yourself when you pray. You're making your spirit man strong and you're making your natural man weak. And that's the benefit of fasting. When you're fasting, guess what? You, 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 you cause your flesh to get your spirit rather to gain ascendancy over your flesh. You make your flesh weak and your spirit strong while you're praying and praying in the Holy Spirit, especially. So your spirit, man, amen, is churning like a generator. It's generating that power that you need for whatever it is that you're fighting up against. Amen. And so as a result, it makes you strong. Praise the Lord. So remember what did Jehoshaphat do? They prayed and they fasted. They called a fast. Now, they didn't pray in the Holy Spirit because it wasn't that time yet. Amen. That only happened to the New Testament church. But basically what they did is they called the fast and they prayed. And as a result, the Holy Spirit said. And so that's what we need to do. Strengthen ourselves in the Holy Spirit. Now, Ephesians chapter 6 says this. Ephesians um, chapter 3 rather says this. Notice what Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. And this is a good prayer for us to pray for ourselves. Amen. And for one another and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14 says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit and the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So this is the prayer that Paul prayed, that we may be strengthened with might by his spirit in our inner man, in our spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then in Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Okay. Notice what the scripture says here. Psalm 73. Closing out on one more scripture, and we're we're through. Notice what he says. <laughs> oh my God, Hallelujah! Notice what the scripture says. Verse twenty-two says, "I was so foolish and ignorant; I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand, and you guide me with your counsel." And afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Notice what he says. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And in Habakkuk, Habakkuk the Bible says in Habakkuk 3. Notice what Habakkuk says. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be in the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no fruit, though the flocks may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. Amen. The Lord is my strength. We don't have to be strong. We just need to be in him, and he makes us strong. He makes us strong. We don't have to front for people. We can take the back seat. We can take the lower part. Jesus said when you go to a, a banquet or something like that, go for the lower seat. You don't have to be what you don't need to be. You just need to be in Him. Father, thank you so much for this word, for this lesson. 
It is my prayer that you will seal it in the heart of these, your people, those who listen, Lord, and those who desire to exercise the grace of humility that you've given us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for speaking to us tonight, giving us words of encouragement, Lord. We know that we're coming upon critical times, but Lord, we thank you that you're with us. You've given us your Holy Spirit who will be with us until the end. You did not leave us as orphans, Lord. And Lord, even when we get into situations whereby it seems that we don't know what to do, may our eyes be upon you. And we bless you and thank you for these precious lessons that you've given us through Scripture. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God, we thank you. Well, praise the Lord. We thank you so much for joining us today. As I said before, like, share, and subscribe to our channel. We have some real good things that we have to share with you. And until next time, this is Kenneth Dentley reminding you of 1 John 4 and 4. You are of God, little children, and I've overcome the world because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God bless you. Goodbye. Shalom. Until next time. If you are listening to this message today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I'm not talking about joining a church. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. See, one of the things that people are going to hear from the Lord when they're judged is that, well, Lord, I, I pray to you, I knew you, and, and all these things that we will say to the Lord. However, the Bible says that the Lord will say in that day, depart from me, I never knew you. So the important question is not whether you know the Lord or know of the Lord, but rather the Lord knows you. And so today, you can discover whether your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and be sure about it by accepting the Lord as your own. Lord and personal Savior. Listen, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You don't have to perish. You only have to believe that God sent his son and receive his son, obey his son, and follow his son. And salvation will be yours. For the scripture is clear, it says that if a man confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God has raised him from the dead, he shall be saved. That salvation alone is predicated on this, that a man will turn away from his sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal salvation and forgiveness of sin. From that point, his sins are thrown into the sea of forgetfulness to be remembered no more. The Lord will send his Holy Spirit to live on the inside of him and he will change his entire nature into the nature of someone who we call born again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new and all things are of God. So if you're ready today to make that decision to turn away from sin, to turn away from selfishness, to turn away from Satan, and turn to the Lord for the forgiveness and departure of sins. Pray this prayer with me right now. Heavenly Father, I come to you, a sinner in need of a Savior. The Bible says, if I was to confess with my mouth that Jesus is truly Lord and believe with all my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. Your word said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I can't save myself. I'm sinking too deep in sin, but I call upon you to save me, to forgive me, and to write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. From this day forward, I will turn from sin, from selfishness, from Satan to the Lord and make him my savior and my Lord. Thank you for writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life and giving me grace to overcome 
and defeat sin in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And God, we thank you. Well, my friend, if you have prayed that prayer with me, I have an email address at the bottom of the screen right now. Send me an email, let me know that you have began your walk with the Lord. Let me shout the victory with you and do what we can to help you to continue in the journey in Jesus Christ. So thank you so much for getting in touch with us. We'd like to hear from you very soon. God bless you.